Hi everyone, it's James here. Welcome to another video, Vinyl Finds. Here we go again, and uh, still playing catch up. Got lots to show, but not particularly today. I've picked out four records, all of which are reissues. I think I'll group them together, um, all bought new. Um, I'll show those, and then in the next, maybe in the next Finds video, I'll show a mounting pile of secondhand stuff that I've got on the go. Uh, anyway, we'll see. Um, just a quick shout out before I start, a channel, not a new channel, um, newer than mine, but when I've been there since about 1928, haven't I? Um, a great guy called Lee, who actually lives in Wrexham, which is my hometown. I don't live in Wrexham anymore, but I think Lee does. He shops at Moonlight Records, where I um, have been known to frequent, and um, his channel is called Midnight Special. He shows some really good stuff. He shows some footage of Moonlight, which I haven't managed to do yet. And uh, it's quite funny, actually. I've seen him flicking through the racks there in, uh, in, in Moonlight, flicking past records that I subsequently bought. Kind of strange experience. But, um, yeah, he's a great chap. Uh, he, I think he's, he's, I think he's been on sabbatical and he's made a bit of a comeback. Anyway, I'll leave a link down below. Do check out his channel. Uh, good taste in music. Um, Good guy, that's Lee at Midnight Special. Right, four reissues to show you. Um, they're all of um, old music, obviously. Um, the first one is, uh, I need to give a shout out to Chris at the Vinyl Orchard, who incidentally has been making some fantastic videos lately. I think Chris has retired in the last few months and he's just churning out top quality videos of all shapes and sizes. But um, a while ago he did a video highlighting might have been a hundred great new wave and punk albums and he showed this record and I don't even remember now what made me think right I'm going to get that record uh, it might have been because I'd heard of them already or something that he said I can't quite remember I mean he showed some great stuff in the video half the records I had and half of them I didn't have this is one which I didn't have and the cover is very attractive and uh, I just thought wow I'd love to own that it's my period of music it's my kind of thing a punk sort of new wave band um, the members uh, who were from Surrey, I do believe. This is one of three albums they made in the late 70s and early 80s at the Chelsea nightclub, which I think is known as being a bit of a classic. And this was um, a limited edition reissue, 422 of 500. But I got it from a really good price um, on Amazon, I think. Um, it comes in a slightly pukey um, green vinyl. But uh, some interesting history with this band. They were produced by Steve Lillywhite, who obviously had a huge profile in the 80s. And I've got a feeling that his brother, Adrian Lillywhite here, I think that's his brother uh, on drums and percussion. Um, so, so they were on Stiff Records originally. They did a song um, released on Stiff, which they later re-recorded for this album. I think it was Solitary Confinement, I think, was recorded uh, and released on Stiff Records, and then they re-recorded it on this. But the big, I think the big single from this record, um, on Virgin this is, um, was The Sound of the Suburbs, which is just a cracking song. It's punk rock, really. It's got that kind of um, edgy, you know, spunky kind of sound. But um, elsewhere on the record, they experiment with, you know, reggae. It's got a bit of an open an open-minded approach to music on this record, really. Quite funny, you know, quite satirical, um, and uh, yeah, just great fun. Good sound on the um, on the record as well, it sounded tremendous. So uh, yeah, thank you, Chris, for alerting me to that. He's just shown it again, actually. He did a video recently, uh, top 20 favorite new wave punk albums, and this came, I think it came mid-table somewhere, but definitely a fun album. I really enjoyed it. Sound of the Suburbs by the members. Right, by contrast, this next one is a record that I've known about and had in my collection actually for years. I had it, or I have it as a twofer, the band's first album and their second album as a twofer, bought years ago. I've been looking for a copy of the record just as a single album, but I think they're quite rare. You don't often see them. I think mainly because um, the album didn't sell at the time. This is The Move and Shazam which is their second album. And um, it's amazing, actually. The first album, is, which is a really great LP, um, didn't sell too well, but it has some great stuff on it. You know, it's got Fire Brigade on it, and um, I Can Hear the Grass Grow, Kilroy Was Here, you know, great British pop psych. And by the second album already, the lineup had essentially fallen apart. Um, Ace Kefford and Trevor Burton had left the band, and we've got um, Rick Price instead. 
Carl Wayne, the singer, was still there. Roy Wood, songwriter extraordinaire, Bev Bevan on drums, and uh, a very, very different album to the first one. Um, really, I think, sowing the seeds of ELO in this, really. The third track, Cherry Blossom Clinic Revisited, which is an extended version of a song that had been on the first album, but it's interspersed with bits of Bach, and there's, there's all sorts of little classical motifs going on, and extended sections here and there a bit of prog rock going on for certain um side one is all roy wood stuff um hello susie which um amen corner did a cover of which is a great track it's got this really heavy sort of dirty guitar on it a slower version than um amen corners it's really almost sort of um sludgy really almost sort of black sabbathy Beautiful Daughter, which uh, is a fantastic song. It's sort of, well, it's very Beatlesy, really. Quite acoustic, just got, got a great melody. Um, quite quite McCartney-ish, I've always loved that one. And then, as I said, Cherry Blossom Clinic <clears throat> goes through all these strange symphonic parts and is uh, just has a great kind of um, late 60s vibe to it, really. It's, uh, it's quite mad. And then side two um, has a couple of cover versions. In fact, all three songs are covers. Fields of People uh, by Wyatt Day and John Pearson and Don't Make My Baby Blue by um, Barry Mann and Cynthia Vile. Both of those are pretty good. They're not like brilliant, but they're okay. But the last song on the album, which is the last thing on my mind, a cover of the Tom Paxton song, that's always been a favourite of mine. I first heard it on a, a Move Best Of cassette which I had back in the 90s and I remember going on a, a long sort of holiday down to the coast on my own and just playing this song over and over again it's got the most incredible psychedelic guitar solo on there by Roy Wood I think it's by Roy and uh, amazing vocals by Carl Wayne great sort of masked psychedelic arrangements it's just absolutely brilliant about a year after hearing the song I remember I picked up a Tom Paxton LP from a charity shop which had that song on it um, the last thing on my mind and I couldn't believe it when I heard it I couldn't believe what the move had done to it turned this very simple folky little song into this huge um, psychedelic epic it's absolutely tremendous and it ends on this really long sustained psychedelic sort of vocal arrangement it's just brilliant absolutely hair raising so um, nice to get this really really nice um, pressing sounds tremendous so uh, yeah Gave up on the idea of a uh, original version of that. Went with a reissue. Why not? Right, this one I bought from uh, Heightside Records, I think, which is my local market traders uh, here in town. I got it at a good price. I think it was a tenner. And it's a reissue. I think it was maybe a record store day reissue or one of those, you know, vine, you know we love vinyl... Um, relaunches they do from time to time and again a record this is a record that i've never actually owned this is the original uh, first album by the damned um yeah and what a noisy beast this is <laughs> um produced by nick Lowe, and um it's just it is a blast of, of filthy punk energy um i played i played this once um, and I kind of whacked up the volume and it, it really did, it almost blew my stereo out, you know. It's one of those records, and I'm not sure how many times I'm going to play it, because you have to really sort of make a date with yourself, right? I'm now going to listen to the Downs' first album, you know, it's not backing, it's not backing music by any stretch of the imagination, it's very, very full on, full throttle, but you can definitely see um, why it made such a huge impact at the time. Comes with a couple of... Um, bits and pieces you've got a bit of a cardboard replica there and a really nice booklet actually um which um comes with some messily presented punk rock style sort of you know liner notes and um quotes from the band actually which is uh, which is quite interesting it's just it's really well done i think it's an excellent an excellent reissue sounds tremendous i've never heard the original i've never had an original copy of it so um can't compare but uh it does sound absolutely brilliant and this was i think this was a nick Lowe production was it a nick Lowe production i know their first single was produced by nick Lowe. yeah produced by nick Lowe. um interesting choice of producer for the first album obviously he was on the sort of pub rock scene at the time but i mean his records don't sound anything like this he clearly knew what he was doing he knew how to <laughs> capture their uh, raw energy but um yeah great fun Great to have it in the collection. As I said, there'll be certain times when I feel like playing it and maybe certain times when I don't. 
uh, but it's um, it's certainly a good thing to have. So there we go. That's the damned <coughs> and um, the damned. Yeah, neat, neat, neat. New Rose. That was the first single, wasn't it? That was the first punk single of all time, I think. Uh, right now, the final one is an interesting one and this is an album which i knew about already i'd streamed it a couple of times and i really enjoyed it i thought this is actually really good um i saw that there was a reissue going that was not too expensive so i picked it up and um i am pleased i did with just a couple of caveats this is approximately infinite universe by yoko ono which i think came out in maybe 74 something like that um so, I don't know the ins and outs of the backstory to this. It was recorded, I think, with the guys from the band Elephant Memory. Elephant's Memory, who, of course, were the group that had um, backed up John and Yoko on the Sometime in New York City album. And whatever you think about Yoko Ono and the experimental stuff that she does, this album is not that. It's definitely a rock album. It's pop rock, a bit of psych in places, a bit of baroque pop, a bit of... Um, sort of proto new wave stuff going on as well. I mean, you know, she was always ahead of the curve. You've got some really, really interesting, quirky, unusual songs, great lyrics, um, some fairly heavy handed sort of proto feminist stuff going on. Um, I have a woman inside my soul. There's the song title, uh, a great song called I Want My Love to Rest Tonight, which, um, it's interesting, this album, you can hear, I think, little, you, well, you get little insights into her relationship with John coming through. Um, but some quite spiky stuff as well, some quite sort of edgy stuff. Um, where's the song? So there's a track called I Felt Like Smashing My Face in a Clear Glass Window. Um, but, you know, that gives you a, <laughs> a sense of some of the kind of harder edge stuff on this record. Um, the title track, Approximately Infinite Universe, is really brilliant. It's um, sort of symphonic, psychedelic rock. It's really, really tremendous, actually. Um, and, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to like about this album. Just a couple of caveats. There's a skip. The stylus is, skips on my, uh, on my copy every time during the song What Did I Do, which is one of my favourite songs on the album, so that's a bit annoying. Uh, I've tried cleaning it, doesn't make any difference, so unfortunately I'd bought the record and hadn't listened to it. I, I spent a long time before listening to it, so I, I didn't really feel I could send it back after the length of time had elapsed, so that's really annoying. The other thing about this record is I just haven't fallen in love with it. I don't know what it is. I think part of it might be that the band is a bit ordinary. Elephant's Memory, I don't think they had a great reputation for being, you know, great players or anything. So in fact, some people have said that about the Sometime in New York City album, that it's got some good stuff on it. But the playing is just a bit undistinguished. They don't really do anything that jumps out at you. Quite sort of ordinary instrumentation. You know, the drummer's quite just a bit nondescript, I suppose. And I think these songs deserved maybe a more, a sort of more cutting edge band, you know, a band that had a bit more about them, a bit more of a kind of early new wave thing. It's a strange thing about John and Yoko that they were sort of, they were known as experimentalists and they moved to New York and, you know, they set up there, but they didn't really get involved with the punk scene, the new wave scene. John didn't get, didn't take any interest, I think, really in the CBGB scene or, you know, he didn't listen to those bands. He never really talked about bands like Television and Ramones or anything like that. And uh, it's a shame, I think. This album was a bit of a missed opportunity. I think with more exciting, more innovative players, it could have been, you know, something really brilliant. I do think the songs are good. I think Yoko sings really well. As I said, it's not a kind of screaming banshee um, Yoko thing. It's her in kind of rock pop mode. And it's quite impressive because, to my knowledge, Yoko was not really into pop or rock music when she met John Lennon. She was a conceptual artist. She was a classically trained musician. But I don't think she'd ever considered rock or pop music to be something that she was going to investigate or explore. But she feels totally... It's, it sounds like she's totally at home in the genre. She, you know, she inhabits it in quite a natural way. It doesn't sound like a sort of uneasy fit. Interesting record. Like I said, good songs, good singing. Uh, I just wish that the band was a bit, um, a bit better, really. Anyway, uh, that was a bit of a ramble, wasn't it? Four records and it's taken me 15 minutes, so maybe I'll try and chop some out. We'll see. Um, that'll do for now. Hope you enjoyed it and uh, I'll catch you in the next one.